Okay, we are going to get started. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining today's panel on careers in healthcare quality. My name is Lauren Hartwell. I work as a project manager for Tufts Health Plan, and I serve on the board for the New England Association for Healthcare Quality. The New England Association for Healthcare Quality is a nonprofit organization that empowers healthcare quality professionals from every specialty throughout New England by providing education, networking, certification preparation, and professional practice resources. NEAHQ provides a a strong voice for healthcare quality by active involvement in appropriate healthcare quality initiatives. So on behalf of everyone at NEA, NEA HQ, we are so grateful to be here today and we look forward to speaking with you. I'm going to kick us off with a brief introduction to QI presentation and then we'll, and we'll then moderate the panel discussion to follow. So we can all see my slides. Yes, great. All right. Going to give a brief intro to QI, talk about some definitions, uh, key principles to keep in mind, why it is important to do quality work, and a little brief overview of some QI models and um, the QI toolkit. And I'll close out with some electronic resources that you can follow up on. So let's start with some definitions. The Health Resources and Services Administration defines quality improvement as systematic and continuous actions that lead to measurable improvement in healthcare services and the health status of targeted patient groups. The CDC expands that a little bit. Um, they talk about continuous and ongoing effort to achieve measurable improvements in the efficiency, effectiveness, outcomes, and other indicators of quality services, which achieve equity and improve the health of community. So I like that they bring in the equity element and, and, and broadening that to include health of communities. And then the Institute of Medicine defines QI as the degree to which health services increase the likelihood of desired outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. And they identified six domains that, that for quality care, meaning that high quality care is safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. So a couple points to emphasize here. Continuous and systematic is an idea that comes up a lot. Quality is supposed to be iterative, iterative work um, to, test, to test different changes to your system. And then measurement, right? You need to know that um, your improvement is measurable, can be quantified and demonstrated. So you need process and outcome metrics. And then, um, you know, the IOM talks about bringing in professional knowledge. So you want to make sure that, that your changes are grounded in evidence-based practice. And then finally, um, some consistent themes around efficiency, effectiveness, and, and health equity are very important too. So uh, some key principles to think about when doing quality improvement work. Focusing on systems and processes. Quality is directly linked to an organization's service delivery approach or their system of care. To achieve a different level of performance, an organization's current system is going to have to change in some way. And so you need to kind of think about the, those holistic systems and processes when planning your QI, QI efforts. And then a focus on patients. And if you're on the payer side, we, we refer to them as members. So an important measure of quality is the extent to which patients' needs and members' needs and expectations are being met. And so when you're thinking about improving um, quality for, for patients and members, that means improving patient access and creating systems that make care a little bit more accessible, um, implementing patient safety programs in your organization, engaging patients and families in um, quality improvement work, and then thinking about cultural competence. So um, make sure that you're assessing health literacy with patients and members and that you're engaging in, in patient-centered communication and linguistically appropriate care. And then talking about um, a focus on, on teamwork. QI is absolutely a team process where you're harnessing the knowledge, the skills, the experience of different individuals to make your improvements. And you need that team approach to QI because 
processes and systems are often very complex. So there's not one person who knows all of the dimensions of, of a process. And so you need to bring in multiple disciplines or people from multiple departments to, to come together and, and come up with creative solutions that um, work for everyone, right? So that staff commitment and that buy-in are really important to get your, your QI objectives accomplished. And then finally, data always need to have a focus on the use of data. We use data to describe how well our systems are working at baseline, what happens when we make changes to those systems, and documenting successful performance. So, you know, you need data to indicate whether your changes have made an improvement. There's no way around it. And, and using a data-driven method can make sure you're not using solutions that are ineffective, right? And instead, we want to we want to um, demonstrate what does work. Then we want to monitor that over time using data, so to ensure sustained improvement, and then you know scale it up if it's if it's going if it's going really well. And so when we talk about why we do QI work, I think improved patient and population health outcomes are probably the most obvious, um, and that includes both process and and outcomes uh, improvements, but also a much more efficiency in our, our administrative processes and in our clinical processes. We can avoid costs associated with process failures, errors, and, and redundant actions. And really the goal is to develop proactive processes. We want to be recognizing problems and implementing solutions proactively instead of reactively so that we have really reliable, robust systems. So let's quickly touch on um, models, QI models that your organization might use, um, or when you are when you are in your your careers that you might use um, to test changes to a system. Um, IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, advocates for the model for improvement. So you have to identify your your goal, your your smart aim. What are we trying to accomplish? What changes do we want to test? And there's a a whole bunch of QI tools that can help you identify what those change strategies might be. And then, um, you know, how do we know that a change is going to make an improvement? And that's your measurement, right? You need to have metrics around that change. Then you, you implement a little PDSA cycle. You plan what you're going to do. You carry it out. You collect data. You analyze that data. You study that data. And then you make a decision, right? This is either not working at all and we need to scrap it or it's working really well and we want to scale it up, or it might need a little tweak. So we're going to tweak it and then retest it before we, we do any scaling up. And that's what you decide in the ACK phase. Lean Six Sigma uses a, a similar methodology. It's called DMAIC. It, it walks you through the same processes I just outlined. You have to define your problem. You have to collect data to quantify that problem, identify your root causes and what your change strategies are going to be, implement them, use data to make sure they're working. And then if they're effective, you, you maintain the solution in the, in the control phase. And then finally, this is just a, a laundry list of potential QI tools. Um, a fishbone diagram can help you identify different parts of your systems that might be having issues. Key drivers can help you identify which change strategies you want to prioritize, which ones you think are going to have the most impact um, to address those, those problems. Flow charts and process maps help you, um, you know, get get sort of your your process outlined, and maybe you can identify where where there's some inefficiencies or some bottlenecks. And then Pareto charts, run charts, control charts, those can really be used to help um, uh, quantify. Uh, I'm sorry, visualize your data, your measurement, um, and and show that improvement as we discussed. A couple resources if you want to follow up. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, as I mentioned, IHI um, advocates for the model for improvement. They have so many great training resources, free videos. Go check it out if you want a little bit, want to learn a little bit more about um, the model for improvement specifically. Um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is a great resource. The National Asso Association for Healthcare Quality is the national parent agency for NEAHQ. Um, and then, of course, uh, the New, New England Association for Healthcare Quality um, is your, your local resource. Just want to put a shameless plug in there that um, we do offer a student membership. And if you're interested in checking out our student membership benefits, please go to neahq.org. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead um, and 
uh, stop the slides for now and stop my screen share. We are going to commence the panel portion. Um, so we have our panelists here on the screen with me. I will be moderating the panel, as I mentioned. Just wanna do some quick logistics. We're gonna be, um, I have some questions that I'm gonna start with, but then we wanna open it up to your student questions as well. If you have questions throughout the panel, um, just put them in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on it. And when it's time to get to student questions, I'll just run the list of your questions. Um, and then of course, if there's time, we can always um, unmute and have discussion if, if we get to that point. So um, let's start with introducing our panelists. I'm gonna go around and ask each one of you to please give the students a little background on yourself, um, including how you, you got involved in, in your quality improvement career. All right, um, let's start with Lynn. You're to my left, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. My name is Lynn Myers. I, my initial training was as a nurse. I've been a nurse for a long time. Um, at the time, I was a nurse manager, and I went back to graduate school to get an MBA. And that's where I really first became um, interested in and heard about the quality gurus, Deming, Duran, Crosby, those kind of people, and really um, started to think about that and become more involved in that. And from there, from nursing management, my career did progress more into the quality improvement realm. I worked in case management and risk management and quality management in a number of organizations. I'm currently a quality project leader at Tufts Medical Center. And in this role, I oversee some regulatory readiness, um, making sure that we comply with various federal, state, and um, eight other agency standards and regulations, and some quality reporting in the public domain. So if you went to CMS, um, at Hospital Compare or something like that. There's hospitals and other organizations report quality data that's publicly available so that pro providers and the public can then compare providers and perhaps choose a provider based on the quality of care and services that are available to them. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> um, let's jump over to Paula and have her introduce herself. Sorry. It's always that moment where you're like, am I on mute? <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, I'm Paula Benetti Velasquez. I am a senior performance improvement consultant at the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, and I completed my MPH at BU School of Public Health. And then I started getting interested in quality when I was taking a course, a practice based course uh, for program implementation. And we had a module on quality improvement. And I just thought, like finally, this is how you solve really complex problems with so many stakeholders in an organized way that is not too intimidating um, and uses a lot of common sense and participation. So um, I love that module. And then I took another class called operations management that was with my current boss. She was my professor there. And, uh, and she was looking for somebody to help create the performance improvement team at CHA. And so it was, uh, it was just a really good timing for me. I got very lucky. Um, in my role at CHA, I work with uh, different teams in all departments and the executive uh, sponsors to plan and implement different projects for, uh, for you know, better outcomes, better clinical outcomes, more efficiency, less uh, provider and staff frustration with our EPIC system, um, <laughs> and you know, just better data to make sure that we're doing the best that we can. My, uh, my sort of specialty area that I focus on is psychiatry. That's our biggest service at CHA. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that's a good. All right, sense. that sounds great. Yes, thank you so much for sharing, appreciate it. Okay, um, we'll jump to Allie and then Elisa will finish with you. All right, great. Um, thanks, Lauren. So um, I started my career as an occupational therapist. So that's what, where I was trained and that's my clinical background. Um, I went pretty quickly into healthcare operations um, in the hospital setting um, and um, really got involved with quality 
because I was in an operations role where I was really looking um, or was tasked to look at data, find meaningful metrics and improve upon them for, for six different departments really. So it was sort of an overhaul. Um, and, you know, there I started sort of studying, well, what's, you know, obviously the best way to, um, to create uh, key performance indicators and, and make improvements from there. So, so there, um, from there, you know, sort of took a few courses in quality improvement um, and then, um, and really started, you know, that path from there. Um, I currently work um, for United Healthcare, um, and that's a, a health insurance company. Um, my role is a quality improvement consultant. So I'm working with accountable care organizations across New England. Um, and really the focus is helping them to improve their clinical quality metrics, um, specifically working with primary care physicians. So looking at um, colorectal, breast cancer, and other cancer screening metrics, and, and really ensuring that we're improving upon those rates. Um, additionally, you know, chronic condition measurement, uh, looking at um, screenings for diabetes, for instance, and, and making sure that we're getting those patients in who have diabetes in for those annual screenings um, to ensure that they're, you know, being well managed and, and um, prevent uh, complications from, from their illnesses. Um, I also work with these groups um, on risk adjustment coding as well. So making sure that, you know, as they're seeing patients that have chronic illness, um, that they are coding for those every year. Um, and that really is for, for two reasons. One, um, to ensure that we, you know, as, as the um, health insurance company, but also CMS and other um, entities that we work with have the accurate information on a population for the communities that we serve. Um, but secondly, really ensuring that those um, conditions are coded annually so that we get the funding necessary from the federal government to be able to take care of these patients. So, so that's um, really key. And then also really looking at um, improving annual care visit rates um, and just general um, improvement around processes within the office. Um, so that's really what I focus on um, currently. But I've also worked as the director of of um, physician network quality um, for a health system um, and really doing some similar work, but really internally with, with the, the, um, the groups and making sure that they were meeting um, the standards for regulatory uh, accreditation and requirements and, and things like that. So um, I've had quite a bit of experience in quality. Quite a bit. Yes, lots of experience on this panel here. So think about your questions for them. All right, Elisa, take us home here. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, all right, so my name is uh, Elisa Rajwani. I work at Tufts Medical Center um, as the Assistant Director of Performance Improvement. Prior to that, I also worked at Cambridge Health Alliance with Paola um, and um, also have a background uh, practicing clinical dentistry. Um, and so in terms of my journey, um, you know, I trained and practiced clinically as a dentist for a couple of years before I decided to make the switch uh, full time to what I do now. Um, through my time in dental school, I started working with this um, developmental agency called the Aga Khan Development Network uh, that's headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. And that's where I first got interested in, you know, healthcare systems improvement and decided to pursue my MPH. Um, and I got my MPH with a focus in health management from the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, in terms of what I do now at Tufts Medical Center, so um, a big area of focus for me and my team is working on all things process improvement for the medical center. Um, and I wear three types of different hats as part of my role over here. Um, so broadly speaking, uh, a big part of my portfolio is working on process improvement initiatives that are focused on all things related to efficiency and patient flow um, and all the tools that Lauren described as part of her presentation, right? So we use concepts and uh, uh, themes and tools from the world of Lean and Six Sigma and the IHI model for improvement. 
Um, the other kind of uh, hat or bucket that I work in is again related to again systems improvement, but um, many of our projects could also stem through adverse patient outcomes or patient safety events that have proved to have a root cause that's associated with um, you know, some sort of systems defect or you know, a process related defect. And again, we use similar types of methodologies to solve problems of those sorts. Um, and the third kind of hat that I wear is I lead this program called the Quality Academy uh, for, for the Medical Center, which is a learn by doing training where um, we run this a couple of times a year. Uh, it starts off by us teaching uh, specific frontline staff and members from the organization uh, tools from, again, the IHI model for improvement and other PI methodologies. Um, we actually have about six to eight teams that do this every cycle, and they actually work on their own you know, PI projects and deliver outcomes in about a 90-day cycle. Um, and a similar sort of program um, is also conducted for some of our residents and members of our house staff from across medicine uh, you know, and other specialties like neurology, neurosurgery as well. Um, and what I didn't really mention was I serve on the NEHQ Board of Directors and uh, co-chair the program committee with Lauren as well. So happy to talk more about that. Awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about your experience. I want to talk, and this is sort of a two-part question, but I want to talk a little bit about what is the most rewarding thing about your quality improvement work and what is the most challenging thing about your quality improvement work? Anyone feel passionate about those and want to kick us off? I can, Lauren. So I think, you know, the first question is, um, you know, really what's, what do I really feel, um, you know, rewarded by in the work that I'm doing? And, you know, I think um, for me, you know, I, I was an occupational therapist. I used to work directly with patients. Um, I no longer do that but I do feel that I still have an impact in the outcomes of patients um, really around. And I feel particularly, um, you know, passionate about making sure that, that folks are coming in for, um, for their regular screenings, you know, for cancer, you know, we want to prevent people from getting sick down the road. Um, and it's so important. And, you know, I have a, um, a husband who had cancer a couple of years ago and he's fine now, but you know, it particularly hits home for me. I also have a sister that has type one diabetes and I know all of the challenges that she's faced. So for those, you know, chronic screenings that, that need to, um, to happen for folks with diabetes or other chronic illnesses, I feel very um, passionate and, 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 and I really enjoy working with um, those groups to help them understand not only you know, and really when you're talking with doctors, they know the clinical need. Um, it's more so understanding the structure of the measurement um, and, and around talking with folks around how to improve, you know, sort of the process of making that happen. Um, so I'd say that was, that's what, you know, I feel most passionate about is still being able to impact um, patient care, even though I'm not working directly with patients. And then the most challenging, I would say, is just, for me, um, the, the many priorities. <laughs> it's sometimes hard, right? You know, when you think about QI and um, you think about, you know, all of the things that need improvement, um, sometimes it's difficult to really um, figure out, you know, what are those priorities? We can't possibly fix everything, right? And there's usually lots of things on the list. So I think um, it's challenging to get people, um, key stakeholders to really um, think about and talk about what really are those priorities? What can we, you know, what are those few things that we can really work on and make, make a dent in um, and then work down that list as we go. So I think that's, for me, uh, the biggest challenge is trying to figure out how to yeah. act on so many um, priorities. Yeah, QI, QI strategy and prioritization is certainly a challenge. I think probably all of all of our organizations face. Lynn, I see you've come off mute. You got something to add? Um, I would echo Allie's um, 
sentiments on the the rewards of the position. You really are able to feel like you have an opportunity to improve care and safety um, for more than one patient at a time for the entire population or the community that you serve. Um, when I am working with new people in my department, I very, as far as challenges go, I very frequently remind them that this is not a line operations position. We don't have direct authority over anybody or the process and that um, we need to use other methods to help people to see things in a different way, to want to work on changes, um, really using your influence. Um, so to keep that in mind, sometimes that can be challenging. People are more receptive, but I think that if you keep that in mind and think of yourself as, uh, and you'll see the positions are often called um, QI consultant. You're a consultant to uh, a particular department. Um, and I bet Paola is, <laughs> is, is in exactly that position. Go ahead. Should I jump in? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree completely. Uh, I I hear what you were saying, Ali, about like first you were a provider and then you switched over to this role. And we hear a lot, like I help teach a class with some fellows and residents at CHA and they're always like, oh, how can I jump from like the clinical area to the quality area? And I just tell them like, keep taking care of patients because we really need you, but it's great that you now know all these skills that will help you drive projects without needing me to be there in every meeting. Um, and then to Lynn's point about the consult, like in the consultant position, we don't have any ownership. I think the factor that really like drives whether something is successful or not is the relationships that we have with that operational owner. So, because we can do all the analysis with all the tools and then you know all the pretty presentations and all the gimbal walks and all the data but then if the owner just says oh cool okay well i'm not going to follow this then all the work kind of goes out the window so i i would emphasize and actually that's one of the things that i like that i find rewarding of this position is uh the relationships that we can create with the operational leaders and it's also just a good uh, mentorship like opportunity for me to just learn how they're running their department and then they learn from us to the tools and um, I really enjoy seeing a frontline like clinician or you know scheduler say oh why don't we collect data to see if we've improved or let's do a fishbone diagram I'm like yes you got it yes that's probably the best part the the most difficult part is when we don't have those relationships and we feel like all this work is sort of going nowhere if there's no commitment and uh, like buy-in yeah I talked a little bit about that in, in the presentation, the importance of staff being committed and engaged and empowered. I think you're really talking about empowerment, Paolo, making sure that they are empowered to use these tools when you're not around. Um, but if they're, yeah, if they're not engaged in the process, it can be really difficult to, to do this work. Elise, anything you want to add? I think the group did a great job of you know summarizing it i think it, and and to answer this question really quickly right in terms of uh, what i love about the job is of course you know again similar to the story that ali shared right coming from a clinical background i love to see the impact my work has on actual patient populations as opposed to you know the one-on-one -on -one sort of interaction i used to have when i did clinical practice right and just to kind of add to um you know the challenges piece i think you know one other thing when it comes to qi or Kind of process improvement work as well is just maintaining project sustainability, right? Because when we're talking about quality improvement, we're inherently, you know, changing something as part of either the process or the way we're typically, you know, completing like day-to-day -day operations, right? And um, any sort of change takes time, uh, but, you know, I think keeping track of our data for, you know, months on end just to make sure that our process is sustainable, um, you know, uh, is I think one of the greater challenges. And the minute you've kind of accomplished that, I think you're successful in the project or whatever it is that you're hoping to accomplish. Yeah, okay, thank you all. Um, and if you're interested in learning a little bit more about you know, um, change management or social influence or emotional intelligence, there's lots of great books and articles and resources out there. Those are some 
foundational skills that you will need if you're interested in doing uh, quality work. But um, with that segue, let's talk a little bit more about skill sets and what kind of skills um, are you are you looking for either when you're hiring for QI positions or um, you know when you were looking to you know for students who are um, maybe thinking about um, a, a career in quality. What kind of uh, foundational skills do they need? Do they need do they need to be a clinician to do QI work? Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, who wants to start off? Anyone feel passionate? Alisa. I, I can, yeah, probably get started. All right. Um, and so, you know, in terms of skill sets, right, our department, at least at Tufts Medical Center, is extremely diverse. Um, and as you can see, I think none of us have had, like, you know, a straight trajectory when it comes to, you know, knowing that we were eventually going to end up in the world of QI. Um, and you could very well, you know, have a clinical background or not. We have several individuals, you know, who have clinical backgrounds within our QPS department. We even have individuals who've completed, um, you know, their bachelor's and master's in just like data science. And I have, you know, one individual who's an engineer who's part of my team as well, an industrial engineer. Um, so it eventually, I think it boils down to the core competencies that um, I think are sort of essential for the job. And it kind of boils down to um, you know, your skills with data. Um, of course, you know, just being familiar with the toolkit, Lauren, that you shared as well. Um, you know, just being familiar with some of those basic sort of tools that you need for day-to-day -day QI problem solving as well is definitely advantageous. Um, since I'm assuming that all the folks who are on the call right now, you know, are either in MPH programs or in programs that probably offer similar sort of skill sets. If you're interested in a career in QI, that shouldn't really be a barrier. And um, there are other additional resources that um, you can look into, such as, you know, the IHI website has several open uh, courses that you can take to get some of those QI skills that, that Lauren highlighted. Um, and then I just also want to emphasize some other kind of, you know, um, soft skills as well that I think are extremely important to have because it just boils down to, you know, how effective a communicator are you? Are you, um, you know, do you have some sort of experience facilitating large groups? Because a lot of the work that we do as QI professionals, you will end up dealing with multidisciplinary teams. Um, and, you know, 10 out of the 10 times, my teams would almost always have, you know, a nurse, a doctor, um, a frontline staff person, you know, individuals from EVS, transport, you know, you name it, depending on the type of project you're solving. Um, and so I think just working on those communication skills, those soft skills, um, you know, can, uh, be an effective value add to your toolkit as well. Completely agree. Panelists, anything to add? Um, I would just say, you know, obviously, if, if you're, there's a lot of training involved. Um, so, you know, if that's something that you like to do is teach people, I think, you know, it's, it's a really good um, uh, industry or uh, focus to get into because you're constantly teaching. Um, and then I would just echo, you know, some of what Elisa was saying, you know, analytical skills are so important. Um, any, you know, you know, there's, I'm, I'm assuming as part of your curriculum now that you're, you're taking courses around analytics and, 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 um, advanced Excel, but, but anything that you, um, can, um, improve upon with your Excel skills will be very, very valuable if you're considering um, a job within the QI field. I, I can add, um, I agree completely analytical skills and yes, Excel, we actually ask people if they know how to do pivot tables because that's probably the most basic um, like level that we can handle. Um, and totally agree about communication and, and other soft skills. We've been actually interviewing, we have open positions, so please apply, I will send you the link. Um, but one thing I wanna say is also, it depends on how much bandwidth the team has to teach the new person skills, because like there, are, there have been some times that we're recruiting and I mentor them and like I teach them, even if they don't know PI skills or QI skills, as long as they have good communication skills and they know how to do data, I can teach them the other stuff. But if we have a lot of work going on or we're like in the middle of the pandemic and we don't have 
that much time to teach them, then we're looking for somebody that's like a little more experienced that already has has it and can uh, adapt. I, adaptability and flexibility also. Like some people are very like, oh, I only use the model for improvement. I only use Lean. I only use Six Sigma. And really what Elisa said also applies to CHA. Like we use all of those. And it's really more about understanding which tool to use in different moments, but you can't be fanatic because then people get like offended of the language. And um, so just being flexible and being willing to adapt to whatever the organization has and bring in your ideas. Um, I think that that's also things that we look for in candidates. Completely agree with that point about adaptability. And I think, you know, being willing to take feedback constructive feedback and, you know, act on that too is very important skill to have. And a lot of organizations will offer training. If you don't have, you know, some basic quality improvement training, if you didn't get that in your MPH, as long as you have a willingness to learn and a willingness to be trained, um, many organizations might take you on because you have other good skills that they're looking for. And then you can get formal QI training throughout, throughout your, you know, your first year or two there. Um, let's see, I think, Lynn, you're the only one we haven't heard from. Anything to add? The only thing I would add, I would completely agree with everybody else. The only thing I would add is, um, again, that emphasis on team, really being able to work in a team and work with somebody, with a group. Um, and the, often the PI person is called on to facilitate that team. Um, so again, yeah. Those Allie, people. did we miss you too? Sorry, did you have, did you add anything there? You good? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much. I think this is, uh, I, I just want to pause and quickly check the chat. Have we gotten any? No. Okay. So just a reminder, if folks have questions, they are welcome to pose it in the chat and I will, um, I will bring that to our panelists. If there's something that we haven't covered, please let me know. In the meantime, um, I have some, you know, some other questions we can get through here. So I want to talk about, um, or I, let me rephrase that. I would like you guys to briefly talk about um, some of the differences and similarities between process improvement, quality improvement, performance improvement, patient safety. I mean, these, these when, when you think about students who are applying for jobs, right? Um, or maybe applying for jobs in the near future, sometimes these titles can be different, but kind of the same. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, the similarities and differences across, you know, PI, QI, patient safety, all that fun stuff. Any initial thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, when you look at the difference between performance improvement and quality improvement, um, really, uh, performance improvement is is focused on it, or can be focused on improving systems, processes, or even individual performance, right? Whereas quality improvement um, really focuses more on improving the quality of care being provided by the system. So that's really the the distinction that I see, um, you know, and. Uh, Process improvement tends to be specific to a process, um, but it really is um, used synonymously with performance improvement um, because, because performance improvement includes improving processes. Um, so really, you know, again, the biggest difference for me is, is look, if QI tends to focus a little bit more on like actual quality of care being provided to patients. Thank you, Ali. Anyone want to expand on that? Yeah, and I think the only thing, and I, I think Ali did such a beautiful job of describing this so simply, um, but I, you mentioned the words patient safety as well, right? And I, I always think of that as sort of the true north metric for you know health systems and organizations, right? And just speaking for Tufts, I know one of our kind of organizational goals as part of our CEO strategic plan is to become a high reliability organization. And what that really means is, you know, we definitely want to have safe systems for our patients and reduce the number of um, adverse patient outcomes that occur at the systems level. And so I think all the things that, you know, we do within our 2PS department, right, whether that's working on process improvement or, you know, looking at our quality metrics and our quality indicators, 
all of the other like projects that that we work on eventually have to impact that kind of overarching goal of you know being a high reliability organization and just um, improving patient safety and making sure that our systems are safe for for the patients that we see and that's again kind of linked to um, um, you know just the quality of care piece that Ali described as well so I think all of this kind of eventually you know impacts that sort of goal absolutely um, and just sort of dovetail a little bit and um, you know to the question that you asked as well right I think uh, I did want to expand upon just the world of you know QI and what a typical you know QPS departmental structure could look like and and the reason I bring this up is because you know while I was you know doing my MPH or getting familiar with the world of QI, um, there's just so much that you can do within a typical traditional you know quality and patient safety department, right? And so I know we've spoken about you know performance improvement, right? Um, I think Ali alluded to uh, QI and that sometimes you know leads to um, quality improvement metrics and indicators that are important, you know, not just from a health systems perspective, but also from a payer perspective that I think maybe Lauren and Ali, you can probably highlight a little bit more, right? Um, and these are specific metrics that institutions are supposed to report out on that, you know, point us in the direction of whether are we pro providing good quality of care to the patients that we see at the institutional level, and sometimes are linked to also reimbursement, um, you know, for health systems as well. The third kind of bucket is again, you know, all things patient safety that I spoke about. That sometimes you can have a risk management department involved in, uh, you know, some of these initiatives as well. And then lastly, I think we spoke about this piece a little bit at the start, but it's about just uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, and all hospitals are, or health systems are supposed to be regulatory ready at all time. Um, and the way you can do that is again by having robust processes and systems. Um, that again are conducive to uh, you know positive patient outcomes, and you know you may have federal or state agencies who may come in for surprise surveys, um, and then you know accredited institutions um, and kind of attest and say that yeah we're doing well and our you know hospitals are safe havens for our patients, and so that's essentially how I kind of you know always break break up kind of the different divisions within the QPS department, and the reason I want to elaborate more on that is I think as students. Um, we sometimes may just have, you know, um, a very kind of naive overview of like what the world of QPS has to offer. I really appreciate that. That's a very thorough, that's a very thorough response, Lisa. Thank you. Um, panelists, is there any other pressing things you guys want to share related to this or should I go on to my last question? We're going to move on. All right. So um, let me just quickly make sure we don't have anything in the chat. Okay. All right. So um, last question to, to conclude our panel here. I want to talk about current, current trends or recent changes in the field of quality improvement. One current trend arguably is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, how has that impacted your, your quality improvement work? Um, let's talk a little bit about some of these re recent um, uh, changes we've all had to experience. And, and has that impacted the QI work? Has it changed your priorities? Just want to chat, chat with that as we close out here. Sure, Lauren, and I can start. I mean, as you can imagine, working for a health insurance company and trying to improve um, the rates of um, screenings and coding um, during a pandemic has certainly been challenging. Um, folks don't want to go um, to their to their doctor's offices, or at least they they didn't. You know when um, you know when we were in the thick of it um, in the spring, and then also now as the resurgence of of COVID is happening in many of our communities, um, it has been challenging. Um, you, you know, certainly there's telehealth, um, and we've gotten, um, we've really helped some of the groups that we are working with to ensure they understand um, the changes to the uh, telehealth um, uh, guidelines, or, or really the the um, the the waivers that have you know been been granted um, due to the pandemic. But there's certain things like. Um, you know, you can't you can't test someone's A1C value through the phone, um, and so so we've had to get creative um, about um, making sure that we're still 
um, sort of complying with what's what's needed um, in this setting. So things like helping the the provider groups um, to to send out at home test kits um, to be able to, for those patients to be able to still um, you know get to get screened for um, for A one C or even colorectal screening and things like that. Um, so that you know, has again been challenging. I think overall in looking at the groups that I work with, you know, um, quality rates are down for, for those things. Um, and, and, and it's been a challenge, you know, even with um, annual care visit rates, they're, they're a lot lower than they were last year, even with the telehealth piece. So um, certainly it's, it's definitely been a challenge from my perspective um, in what I do and the work that I do. I think it's been a challenge for everybody, certainly on a lot of different levels. Um, I really saw a lot of my focus shift to um, what needed to be done urgently. You know, we were changing policies and procedures around visitation and testing and um, those kinds of things. So really a need for resources, research, uh, you know, what's the evidence, um, what are other organizations doing, how are we going to manage um, a, a, pr a process like having visitors in the hospital or for the few outpatient visits that we were doing, how could we keep everybody safe and keep sort of a one-way flow of traffic going and things like that. Um, so in some ways, some of the routine work that we do um, kind of shifted and people were not as available. So when we talked about performance improvement projects or performance improvement teams, the frontline providers that would make up those teams really didn't have the bandwidth to focus on um, some of the ongoing projects that that we would have been working on over this time, say, um, preventing patient falls or, or something like that. So again, a lot of things. Um, kind of put on the back burner because of COVID. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's been a big problem. Uh, Paula, Elisa, anything to add? Yeah, sure. Um, I think to to echo uh, what Ali and Lynn have said, we we have put a lot thing a lot of things in the back burner, and now we're getting concerned because, for example, A one C or the lipids test, like we we know that patients need those tests so that we can make sure that they're okay. But uh, unless we figure out a way to go to their homes and get the tests, we can't get them to come in because even just scheduling a visit in our lab is impossible, right? So. Um, that has been a real challenge. Even if we can do telehealth, like for example, for mental health, which is like a great fit for that, or other telehealth like consults for the other services, we can't actually see, like touch the patient physically. And so that decision of whether a patient should be scheduled for a video visit, in-person visit, telephone visit, or telephone call, and then they get angry if you bill them for a telephone visit because they say this is just a checkup with my doctor like why am I getting billed um, that has been a challenge just deciding the guidelines for that um, and also for obviously redeployment of staff across the hospital as we needed to support the inpatient areas with all the COVID patients that has also been a really large project so I would say that how COVID affected our PI or QI team is that we put a lot of stuff in the back burner which actually now we're reevaluating, like, was that actually a priority or were we, were we just working on it because somebody had an idea? And so it's actually a good moment to pause and see if those are still priorities for the hospital or not. And then everything else related to the hospitals, like supply chain, all the masks, redeployment, telehealth, we have been part of driving those efforts. So that's been pretty rewarding, but obviously it's stressful. Absolutely. All right. Alisa, anything to add to that? Yeah, they pretty much covered it. <laughs> that was great. Okay, panelists, thank you so much. Um, these uh, responses were wonderful, very thoughtful. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen one more time here. We have a little uh, acknowledgement slide. Oh, let me actually go into slide mode. How do I, there we go. Nope, that's not it. 
Sorry, guys. <laughs> Having some technical difficulties. All right. Oh, did it again. All right. Sorry. Here's our acknowledgement slide. You can just see it here. <laughs> Um, so really want to thank Sean Kelly, Assistant Director of Career Advising for the Brown University School of Public Health for working with us at NEAHQ to get this event set up. Thank you, Sean. Um, and want a huge thank you to our panelists, Ali, Elisa, Lynn, Paula. You did a wonderful job. I want to encourage um, any students who are um, watching now or later to um, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, we've included some email addresses here. If you have any specific questions for the panel, Panelists, or if you have um, specific questions about the organization that they work for, or as Paula mentioned, um, she's recruiting at, at Cambridge Health Alliance. So um, please feel free to connect with us if you have any follow-up questions. Um, as you can tell, we love to talk and, uh, <laughs> and are happy to continue, uh, to continue doing so. So um, with that, I would just like to thank everybody um, for, for joining us today. We appreciate the time and we're, we're certainly very happy to be here. And uh, Sean, if you don't have anything to add, I will go ahead and uh, conclude for today. All right.